Superman has been around for so long and has been so many things and does so much stuff that it's just like it kind of becomes. Have you seen my big fat Greek wedding? Yeah. That whole like any word I will tell you is Greek origin. <laughs> Kimono. Kimona. <laughs> exactly. It's one of those. Like it goes on yeah. long enough that you can kind of half seriously do that. Any superhero, I will tell you why it is Superman. Yeah, no, I, that, that is definitely the ethos of the Men of Steel podcast. <laughs> And welcome back to the Men of Steel podcast. I'm Case Aiken, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, J. Mike Falson. Welcome back, everybody. So happy to have you here. Yes, we have died and returned. No, that's that's too far. That's that's too much of a bit. <laughs> we're, but we are back. We, we, <laughs> we are back. And uh, today we're doing a bit of a, a wrap up to our conversation about the death and return of Superman cycle. In this case, talking about the video game, because that is uh, near and dear to my heart. It's actually my first way of experiencing this story. And so for that, we are joined by the hosts of Fun and Games with Matt and Jeff. We are joined by Matt Storm. Yep. And Jeff Moonen. Hi there, everybody. And this is just kind of a wonderful conversation. It's a bit of a companion piece to what we did all last night, which is that on Matt's Twitch channel, we streamed playing through the death and return of Superman on Super Nintendo. Yep. And you can find that actually on the Fun and Games YouTube channel. We posted the VOD up there. By the time you're hearing this, it's about three weeks ago. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I hadn't streamed in a while. And also, I don't know the last time I streamed a beat em up. And like, especially when using Game Genie codes, you can kind of brain off, talk on kind of thing. So you're saying this was the death and return of DJ Stormageddon's stream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. I wouldn't use return so boldly yet, but it did remind me that there are other ways to stream besides me playing one game for five hours and burning out and not wanting to do it again for three months. Like if you need to, you can right. split off into a blue and a red stream. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I was gonna say he should get a black and silver stream so Ooh, that it yeah, can yeah. like really get that that resurrection suit vibe. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'll have to commission Aaron to do more variations on the theme. <laughs> yeah, I, I think your Stormageddon shirt just with black and silver as the option like would look pretty cool. It would. It would. Yeah. I'll take that idea into consideration. But yeah, no, it was a lot of fun <laughs> to play this game that I had probably rented at some point, but I don't think I ever seriously played and definitely never beat back when I had an SNES. Good old Blockbuster. Oh, yeah. good old Blockbuster. <laughs> or Hollywood Video here in New York, actually. We had a, a smaller oh, version true. of Blockbuster called Hollywood Video, and like that's often where I went because it was literally two minutes from my house by car, and my dad would take me. Like I'd ask him once a week, can I rent a game? And then mm. I'd go, and of course they'd not have any of the games that I want to rent, and so I'd pick something odd off the shelf that looked interesting like this game. That's how a lot of old favorites were found for me, certainly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about this on the stream last night, and we're kind of just going to jump into it, that there was a market for games that were just rental games, like games mm -hmm. that you would have for that weekend, and you'd play and enjoy it and kind of move on. Like, I didn't own this game back in the day, but I did rent it, and I did beat it, but I beat it the way we did last night, which is that codes were available and I was able to play through. Yeah. I didn't have a Game Genie for the Super Nintendo, so I think that the way I did it was like the the health re renewing code that I shared with you guys. Yeah. yeah, I don't remember exactly, but like it was one of those. So I had played through this whole game and seen it. And like I alluded to at the top of the show, this is the game that I first experienced the death and return of Superman cycle through because this is the early days of trade paperback. So like while I was aware in the media of the whole comic event. I wasn't actively reading Superman at the time. I, I mean, this was 1993 for the event, 94 when the game came out. So I was into comics at this point. <laughs> yeah. But I was like nine. And I my like path for comics was I got into Batman comics first because I was a huge fan of the Adam West show. And then the X-Men cartoon came out. And that's how I like segued into reading comics. But then I was like really into Marvel mm -hmm. at the very beginning of that whole phase. Same. And the 
the death and return of Superman was honestly one of the big things that like brought me over to DC. I was like, I was very into teen superheroes because I was like, you know, a young person and like teen superheroes also looked like adults to me, but they looked like adults that were more like me. As yeah. opposed to- <laughs> but they were still so old. They're 16. <laughs> right. Like <laughs> representation matters, y'all. Like, what, the, <laughs> what about the 16 year old white boys? <laughs> yeah, right. There's not enough for us. Totally. Before we get too far, we should talk about the fact that this game was developed by Blizzard. You know, the folks who make Overwatch and World yeah. of Warcraft and StarCraft. The album. Uh, and it was published by <laughs> Sunsoft. Like, right. like, Blizzard wasn't even big enough to publish their own games yet, which is just wild to me. Well, this was just after Blizzard had changed their company name. I believe they were called Silicon and Synapse before that. They'd done some development, but this was sort of like a reconsolidation, a rebranding. This was their first big one. And Sunsoft had a history with, I mean, a great deal of publishing, including comic book games. Didn't Sunsoft publish the NES Batman game? Yes, I believe they did as well. And also, fun fact, so this came out in 94 slash 95 for the SNES and Sega Genesis. But also, Michael Morheim, who is the lead composer on this game and has worked for Blizzard a long time, also did Blackthorn, another gigantic Super Nintendo game (laughs) that came out not long after this. And, like, went on to work on a ton of other Blizzard stuff. But, like, the crunchy sound design and music for this game is very reminiscent of the beat-em-ups of the time. We mentioned on stream Maximum Carnage, some of the X-Men games. Like, it had that kind of, like synthy feel that a lot of the other soundtracks did back in the 90s and this game like when i played it on stream just brought me back to a time and place that i remember quite fondly that i just don't think exists right now there are beat-em-ups now but i just don't like this was an aesthetic and a time for video games especially on the super nintendo that some games have tried to recapture but it's just i think is wholly unique because of what we've talked about on fun and games a ton which is like limitations and like newness to the technology and all of that stuff crafted these games that unless you intend to do it purposefully you won't just get again by happenstance yeah you're right the indie space has had a bit of a resurgence or a re-stabbing at the beat-em-up genre i mean the indie space has been going back to a lot of old seemingly dormant genres and having some fun with it i believe battle axe is one of the games that was sort of a beat-em-up and they're also based a lot on the kind of capcom coin ops or the D D coin ops that like light RPG-ish elements, and this certainly is not that. But also, a lot of those are built on IPs that they made themselves for a lot of good and obvious reasons. But this one is based off of one of the most covered storylines, or yeah, Case, I have a similar history of comics in terms of, yeah, I was like eight or nine when this happened, seven or eight, I think, and I loved X-Men and I loved X-Men comics. I didn't have a ton of them, but I loved the cartoon. And I would read, you know, my Disney Adventures magazine that talked about yes. different things. <laughs> oh, and I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. that's, how, that's how I knew so much about, like, the, both the, the fake Superman. Yep. And then also when Batman had his back broken and Azrael took over. Like, exactly. I learned about Age of comics. Apocalypse from it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, sense memory, baby. Open it up. But not just... Those sorts of, you know, deeply journalistic places, the death of Superman was covered everywhere. It was definitely one of those big crossover moments into the mainstream. And so people were aware of it, even if they didn't, you know, they knew the black cover that sold five million, six million copies. They know the image of Superman's cape as a mournful flag. But the storyline that came after, eh, nerds know it. Here we are. But... (laughs) This game came out not long after the storyline and is probably the most faithful adaptation of such a storyline into a genre like a beat em up that I've ever seen. Does it make it a great beat em up? Does it what? I don't know, but let's let's go. Yeah, shockingly. One thing about when this game came out and in this era was that this is the dawn of trade paperbacks. So Mm -hmm. like there weren't very many at this point. Like when we did the Wonder Woman coverage, we were like shocked to find out that the contest was the first trade paperback ever done for Wonder Woman. The story where Artemis like takes on the role of Wonder Woman, like 
that's how early in trade paperbacks we were. Mm. The Death and Return may have been the first trade or maybe Man of Steel, but like it was extremely early in actually collecting it and putting those stories out there if you weren't buying the monthly issues at the time. So like even if I had wanted to, I wasn't in the mode of reading Superman books when that story occurred. And thus I would have just like missed it. And so at the time, the game coming out was like one of the ways that you could actually find out about that kind of material, kind of the same way for like movie tie in games yeah. where it's like, oh, well, your parents aren't going to take you to go see Terminator 2, but you can play T2 in the arcade. And so all of a sudden you can like learn some of the story beats. So like this was my way of finding out the story. And it's wild. One, how good they actually like tell the overall narrative. And two, like the fact that I then like went back and had to like figure out like, okay, wait, so is this supposed to be that character? Is this supposed to be that thing? <laughs> mm-hmm. And some things are really faithful and others. It's just like, oh, well, you're walking down the street and there's just a building in your way. And you're just going to like have to fight your way through a bunch of thugs who have Molotov cocktails. I guess, I guess that happens. Mohawk. <laughs> yeah, the mo- Mohawk specifically, like <laughs> Jeff said this on stream. It was a time for video game Mohawk punks, you know, the streets of rage had it. Like they were just everywhere. They were really popular. Yeah. Colorful hair, leather vests, nothing under the leather vests. There was a very specific brand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of people watch the Warrior. Yeah. And then we're like, yeah, let's just do that. <laughs> let's just do that thing. Let's just do that. Whether it's the Warriors or the Baseball Furies, any of the groups, just like that. We're doing that now. Print it. <laughs> So it was a lot of fun looking back at this game because it is surprisingly faithful in very specific ways. And like the Blizzard team working on this, there, there's a lot of quality in weird spots and then a lot of clunkiness in this game. Like it's single player. We kept on venting about how like that would have been such a, a huge fix for it all. The fact that there's only three enemies on screen at any given time is is a big limitation of this game. Some of the level design is not great. <laughs> and the actual like fighting system is like overall interesting, but like there's some clunky parts to it. Like it's so weird how there are things that they get so right. And then there are things that are like, oh, this is just a rookie mistake here. Mm-hmm. I've been trying to find online. Does anyone know how big a game this was? Like how many megs of RAM or anything going on with that one? Because it's not on the Wikipedia page and it's making me curious. I mean, the ROM dump is two megabytes, but I don't know if that's... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess that makes enough sense, which means this is a really small game. Yes. And I, I mean, I think that shows when you're actually playing it, because there's a surprising amount of certain types of content and then a surprising lack of other types. The the fact that so many of the things that you fight are like the same three Mohawk gang members on levels where it's like, wh- why? Is this why, <laughs> why are they the enemies? Why am I fighting these people? Right. Are the flying levels when everyone's a balloon... <laughs> right. The same right, yeah. Cadmus robot balloon thing. But then they do things like have the flying levels. Like there is actually a decent amount of like gameplay variety in here and some cool choices that they make in addition to then just cut and paste for so much of the game as well. Yeah, it's one of those things where I think games at this time when you wanted fodder enemies to fight. I mean, I think of the Ninja Turtles, right? I think the reason the foot soldiers were the common enemy is because they were so easy to pallet swap. That like while there were some stages that had mousers or other things, the foot soldiers or the rock soldiers were the most common enemy because you could just change the color and you had a new enemy, you know? Yeah. I was just doing a little more research. I'm pretty sure the file size for Death and Return of Superman was two megabytes. The typical Sega Genesis cartridge would go up to four megabytes but also they would often have to charge more if those things were. So it might have been a budget concern, as well as the fact that I did some comparisons and the SNES and the Genesis versions are fairly similar. The graphics edge out just a little bit on the SNES and the music is different. But otherwise, they're largely the same as far as sprites and colors and everything else. So, yeah, it's probably just a two megabyte game. So they were figuring out how to make it fit and work to the best of their ability And given, I don't know the development time or the lead time that they had on the storyline for this, but given that it came out the same year that the reign of the Superman storyline wrapped up, that they probably didn't have a ton to work with there. Yeah, that sounds about right. Oh my gosh, the processing power of these games is incredible. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and there are things that are really interesting in terms of like, (laughs) 
<laughs> the actual aesthetics. Like, I still can't get over that the first level that they do it at all. I mean, clearly they just needed a tutorial <laughs> level for you where it's like, here's your Superman mm-hmm. thing. But they give us this level, which is the Man of Steel Morlocks story arc or like the, the Underworlder story arc that is in the trade paperback for the Death and Return of Superman. But it's such a weird level because... There's so few art assets for enemies to fight. And this one level has just a completely unique villains <laughs> that you would face for the rest of the game. <laughs> like for some reason, they might have been working with restrictions the entire time. And then when we need more and we have more space and they made that first level afterwards or towards the end. Yeah, that's a possibility. It's also the only level that has like a proper elevator stage. <laughs> so it, it almost feels like here's a send up to like the tropes of what a like what a Superman beat up should be like, according to like what arcade at the time look like and then the rest of the game is a little different but yeah they get some really good character sprites in there like the Rambo character is a character from the comics and it looks just like when Bogdanov or when Grummet draws that character like it's the blue goat man Mm -hmm. character and he looks perfect and then you get Kloster and he also looks Mm -hmm. perfect and in fact I would argue looks better than Doomsday he kind of did yeah yeah I mean the sprite definitely had more detail I think it's just interesting how Jeff and I like talk about this and and sometimes bicker about this with guests even about how sprite art is better than 3D art. And I don't know that that's necessarily true, but I feel like there's just something to the aesthetic of pixel art that, look, I love The Last of Us like anybody else. It's topical. It's timely. And those games look gorgeous. But like there's just something about it's like, yeah, it looks real. Great. Like I feel like there's more artistry to pixel art because you have to be more creative. It's that whole limitations conversation again. And I'm not saying that artists who create 3d rendered realistic humans aren't creating art. It's just for me, I just, I see the art in pixel art more because of the limitations and having to get creative on how to make things stand out. And I think that mostly plays through if you're talking about likenesses. You can get extremely creative with 3D environments, but if you're trying to create some kind of a likeness, whether realistic or based off of a comic book or whatever else, I would wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. And like there's something to be said for like the Uncanny Valley in terms of like, well, if you're trying to make it look real, you're going to keep getting closer. And, but you have to like do tricks to make your eyes not like rejected mm-hmm. versus like pixel art. Like it's further away from that line. So it can just be fine. And like this one's also not trying to look like a real person. It's trying to look like comic book art. Correct. Like there's specifically spots like the cutscenes that are in here are like almost perfect recreation of panels from the comics. Absolutely. I mean, four or five of them. Yeah, they, not many of them, but yes. they are almost yeah. perfect, the ones that they have. Yeah. I mean, something that we talked about design wise, too, is not only is the pixel art great and those stills are great, but the individual versions of Super I uh, spoiler alert, I guess, for a very old comic. And a very oh, old my game, gosh. But, yeah. <laughs> a, yeah. For a nearly 30 year old storyline. God, I'm so old. Like <laughs> Superman dies and then other Superman rise in his place. And like. You could just do kind of colored palette swaps for some of these, like especially Eradicator, who has the same kind of frame as Superman, but they don't. Mm-hmm. Like they redesign the sprites for each character. Some of them are bigger, smaller. And like we commented on how, like when you're playing as Eradicator, like all the super moves look different. They effectively do the same thing. They're screen clear, but like Eradicator rises to the center of the screen and everything goes dark. It's just. That's the extra step that I think makes this game worth playing and experiencing, even if you're doing it with codes and Game Genie, because those aesthetic choices are really great and really cool to see, because most games of the time would just do, ah, it's a screen clear, who cares what it looks like? But they Mm -hmm. really leaned into how each individual version of Superman would do those abilities. And they even, there are different walk cycles, different attack cycles, different Mm -hmm. attack ranges even that show a, we can sit here and kind of go, oh, did they really couldn't create more art, they couldn't do whatever else. There's a very clear vein of love that goes throughout this. And wherever it can show itself, whether they didn't think it was important elsewhere, they didn't have the time or expertise or whatever else, certainly in the design of Superman and the four Supermen, of Steel, of Superboy, of Cyborg Superman, and of the Eradicator that all show a clear passion for this. And it, if nothing else, it makes me wonder and, and hanker for, for something deeper, something more of this. It's been a long time since I've really delved into the death and return of Superman, but this is maybe like, no, you can make a really cool video game adaptation of this. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. We were doing that the whole time yesterday. Yeah. I mean, like the main show here is definitely the fact that you get to play as all the different Supermen, which like at this time, that was still kind of novel. Like we're not that far off from like Street Fighter 2 not being able to play as the same character on screen at the same time. We are we are not that far away from moments where it was a big deal to have multiple characters versus now where you can have basically the same wireframe and then just different polygons like laid over and different skins. And the main effort is getting the animations and so forth. But that's not actually using the actual art assets for the characters. And they're just being swapped in. In this case, every single motion is its own level of work. Like to create any of these characters is the same level of effort for each. There's no like shortcuts you can make once you've made one. Yeah. And it's also a little different than something like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, where you're full Four characters do play a little different. They fight a little a little different, <laughs> certainly in the earlier arcade game. But you could choose who to be, whereas each of these levels, you it followed a storyline. It wasn't you're dealing with this thing. Pick which character you may fight yourself later because of the story. It almost was the way that some modern fighting game story modes are where here's the order of operations. Here's who you are in it. And it's kind of bold. I definitely don't think that Blizzard was the first one to do it. But there again, it showed a certain amount of appreciation for the storyline and many, many signs that this isn't a lazy cash grab. This isn't none of this is half assed. Anything that fell short fell short for other reasons. Mm -hmm. Certainly not for lack of trying. Yeah. And of course, that's an argument for why the game is single player, which limits its fun as a game, but definitely makes it work better as a story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we're also we're at a time now where there's no shortage of Superman stories. And while Superman solo games tend to all be not great, I'm um, looking at you, Superman. Oh, that's so nice of you to say it like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there have been good stories with Superman. We, we came on the show to talk about the first Injustice. We will eventually do the second one as well. And both of mm -hmm. those are incredible Superman stories and incredible fighting games where, yes, there are nebulous reasons why Superman can't punch through Batman's chest. But like still playing as Superman in that fighting game feels like you're playing Superman. Mm -hmm. you don't, yeah. Even though there's limitations, you still feel like the character. And like at this time for the limitations it had, the fact that every character can fly, the fact that you could just avoid enemies by doing that sometimes, like you do feel like Superman in this game, not on the same extent that like, I think a modern game could get it if they did it right. And like there are games that have had the right idea. Like I still wish that the, Brandon Routh, Superman game, Superman Returns, like it, your health was the city's life, right? Like as the city got destroyed, that was your health bar. Yeah. It's a good idea that didn't mm -hmm. work, Yeah, but it's a good idea. And so like, I feel like this game, just giving you a health bar and kind of not overthinking that side of it and making it video gamey, but otherwise you kind of feel like Superman, I think is really interesting. And honestly, it's why... I don't feel that bad using Game Teeny codes because Superman is <laughs> sort of invulnerable, but yeah. you still get knocked down. You still get hit. Like, and that's that's Superman in the comics, right? He's not unhittable. He's not untouchable. He's just invulnerable. He still feels the pain. He still gets knocked into walls and thrown around and beaten up. You know, I mean, I think about the old Tim Daly cartoon. And I say old now because it has been a while at this point. But he got <laughs> his, but, but he has got he got his ass kicked in that show sometimes, like beaten yeah. constantly. But what still the, the thing that made him Superman was that he got back up. Absolutely right. That's actually what I was going to bring up, especially with Justice League and Justice League Unlimited. They had a basic tenet that Superman was allowed to get knocked down, but he always had to get up and like hit whatever knocked him down in the first place. Like they could wharf affect him, but he always still had to be the one to like get the actual like win shot in if that was the if that was the case. Yeah. Absolutely. Superman was never the one of like the grand strategist or the the martial arts master, but he could get up. And it made it it was a very believable thing of you can see this invulnerable Titan get knocked down, but just as believable that he's going to come back. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I didn't mind it so much at the time when when this came out. It just was like, oh, yeah, well, that's how video games work. You have a life bar. Like, right. that's right. What and it definitely do. smacks of that where it was uh, there's all these little cool, I guess, innovations or keys to the character. But changing something up that fundamentally with no roadmap was probably like, I don't know, because, yeah, I can believe that Superman can go around punching street thugs if he were wanting to go around punching street thugs <laughs> and not kill them because he pulls his punches. But you tell me a chainsaw is going to take him down. That's the, 
That's where I'm going to start questioning your logic oh, about how this yeah. could work. <laughs> maybe it was a kryptonite chainsaw. Did you think about that? Lex no. Luthor would not <laughs> be <laughs> handing out kryptonite chainsaws to street thugs. This is not the gang that he funded. Maybe it was inner gang. How about that? <laughs> well, I was about to say inner gang would be a good <laughs> excuse, especially for the eradicator levels. I mean, like this game could have gotten around it just by its selection of who to fight. And that's where yeah. it's like kind of the generic yeah. thugs are kind of the annoying part yeah. there. Yeah. It's like the first two levels are you well first three levels pardon me are you uh first fighting the the underworlders which they had some stuff like Closter, while he's not in the same caliber as superman is like a big imposing threat and like mm-hmm. you'd be fine with seeing him like knock superman around a little bit like mm-hmm. i would have worked okay and they had like war world weapons like that was like its own like plot thread that had already been set up and then doomsday like doomsday supposed to be able to knock superman around so like those levels where you're fighting doomsday that part is good it's just like well it's weird that the wrecking ball that is just dropping up and down <laughs> this <laughs> this like section of a construction site you're in is also hitting both you and doomsday and like actually doing some damage right and then later, like, you know, when you're fighting Cadmus, it's not that weird that they'd have some weapons that would actually work against Superman. And it's, you know, when you're fighting all uh, the world world stuff later in the game, that also makes sense. So, like, mm-hmm. if it had been like inner gang and it had been set up as like, here's like some Jack Kirby esque kind of weapons that are like from Dark Side or something, it would have fit fine. And then Superboy actually is vulnerable to fire and is a little bit weaker and it would make sense. And same for Steel. Like, Steel actually has a whole plot thread in the comics with the, um, what is it, the Toastbusters or the, uh, the Toastmakers, yeah. like those guns actually would have worked just fine for setting up like characters as being like vulnerable to to those weapon attacks. So they could have pulled just a little bit more detail from the comics and gotten there. This is nitpicking in, the, in retrospect because there's so much they got right from the comics. Yeah. Also, like things like Superboy, I I'm so impressed in retrospect that they got right most of how his powers work. Like, it's annoying that they just gave him generic energy blasts, but it's still not heat vision, which is what I would have assumed that someone going in blind would have done. But they knew not to do that. And like, those are good spots. Yeah, whether that was people at Blizzard really knew their stuff or the folks at DC were doing a great job communicating with them, whatever it was, there is there's knowledge here. Yeah. I mean, I will say that this game got 40s and 50s back in the day. I'm pretty sure it was like middling at best. It's a generic beat em up in a time when there were so many. Right. But I'd say hindsight is 2020 because playing it with Game Genie last night made me realize that aside from the unfair like hits and the like difficulty in getting a punch in on certain characters like freaking cyborg, who is just <laughs> impossible to hit when he's a boss, but you're not that good when you're playing as him like. The worst thing about this game is how cheaply you die. If you remove that, it's a genuinely fun game and has some really cool comic book moments. Like at the end of the game, when you play the last stage as Superman, you don't get to play as Black Suit Superman, which is kind of a bummer. But they show Black Suit Superman fused with Eradicator and become full Superman again. Mm -hmm. For a game that came out in the 90s, it was such a cool little cinematic moment that like actually caught me by surprise. And like... This game is full of those moments. It is definitely not perfect, but I think what's fun about comic book games at this time, your Maximum Carnage, your Animantium Revenge, your Age of Apocalypse, and all of those games, is that they did enough nods to the comics that they felt fun. Unfortunately, game design logic at the time was we have to punish these players so they keep coming back. The quarters. Yeah. <laughs> the quarters. And, and like, right. Y'all mentioning the fact that, yeah, blockbuster rentals, Hollywood video rentals, the idea of there were games that like lived off of getting rented for the weekend. It's like, yeah, that is kind of the weird Charmeleon evolution phase of arcade design reaching home consoles. Right. Well, and you think like this is born out of like your Metroids of the early days and now the Dark Souls games of now and Elden Rings, whatever, like the difficulty is part of the design purposefully to add challenge and that there's a logic to apply. But these older games, they were just hard to be hard. So you would keep coming back. You think of the Lion King game and the Aladdin game and like how later on Capcom and developers who used to work for Capcom said, no, we were told to make these stages like this. So people would struggle and keep coming back to the game and like keep playing it over and over again because they couldn't get through it. Yeah. Like look at the differences between the Contra games, depending on which market Mm -hmm. we're in. Like if you look at Japan, it was like the two hits. Right. And then uh, they were all robots in in Europe. And like the the actual game was easier if you were not in those markets because they wanted Americans to like waste their money. Well, and also think about like how difficult the perception of difficulty at the time too and jeff and i have talked about this before in japan 
Super Mario Brothers 2 was what we got here in the States as Lost Levels because they just made more stages like Super Mario 1, but harder. But they didn't <laughs> think that the American market could handle it, so instead they made Super Mario 2, which I love, but is a reskin of a different game from from Japan and is not the same game. And I think that there's a lot of that design flaw, but it did, I think, I would I would not be surprised if games like this and other difficult beat 'em ups inspired the people who built challenges now making games now, right? You think about the Scott Pilgrim game, which is a hard beat em up, yeah. but it's not impossible because you can get upgrades, you get money. Mm-hmm. Like this was difficult for the sake of driving you crazy. Now games are <laughs> difficult with more or less some semblance of logic. And like as much as I pushed against games like Dark Souls now having beaten Dark Souls 3 and beaten Elden Ring with a lot of help. Uh, like I understand the logic. And of course, beating all of these Metroid games that are also incredibly difficult, like there is there's not a logic through line to this game of how, like it's just difficult sometimes to like mess with you and i think maybe there is a programming logic that we just don't see but it definitely doesn't feel like it no and there's random levels that are way easier in yeah. the middle of the game than at the at the start and at the end yeah. but <laughs> but i think as a whole it's a game that really does pay homage to the source material in a way that we complain about a lot of like Think about the Thor game for Xbox 360 or the Green Lantern game for Xbox 360 or <laughs> like all of these movie tie in games that are just to get a quick cash grab. Just said before, this is not that. And you can see it in the care of the level creation. Like even I was shocked when I would throw enemies against the wall and like the wall would crack or like a wooden boards would shatter or like mm-hmm. you dent like a, a metal gate. Like that kind of attention to detail doesn't happen in a cash grab. This was clearly the the people at Blizzard designing this were fans of Superman on some level or another, or at least were in constant communication with the fans of Superman, the folks over at DC. Yeah. And either way created a game that aesthetically, if you're a Superman fan is absolutely worth playing. And if you're a beat em up fan is absolutely worth playing, but not without some kind of cheat code to help you get through it. Right. <laughs> yeah. De- Infinite lies. There were a few moments where we started kind of just tanking yeah. shots and it was sort of like, well, yeah. whatever. I would say Infinite Continues definitely makes this game a worthwhile challenge. Like you'll have some stuttering points. But like, honestly, even if you're playing it with Infinite Lies, even if you're playing with mm-hmm. Infinite Health, like full on invincible mode, like I think it's worth it just to see the how they tell the story and what they do. Like it's remarkably compressed and they do like a really good job having some of these like really gorgeous environments. Like I think the, the first spot where I really took note of the design beyond just being like, oh, I, I like the sprites and stuff like that was the Cadmus stage, like both the forest outside. And then when they actually go into the like the clone banks and it's so like cool looking, they've got like all these like glowing red tubes where they're like growing yeah. people and like some of those people might be Superboy. You know, it's a very cool section to be in. You can see all this attention to detail that they're putting into what ultimately isn't a game element. It's just there for you to appreciate while you're looking at this like kind of like basic beat up thing but it's like look how cool this thing is look at, at this like comic environment that we're putting out there like the the tree stuff is from jack kirby like that that's like all the cadmus stuff was like stuff he introduced in superman's pal jimmy olsen back in the 70s and like that's such a fun detail just to be exploring in this yeah. game I, I completely agree and i think having now played through it it also as a streamer as someone who i would use the term professional very loosely but like as someone who has streamed a lot of games <laughs> This was a fun ride to do with the three of you as well, because in case you hadn't explicitly said it, when I streamed the game, Jeff, Case, and J. Mike joined me for commentary. And like, A, as a streamer who is often used to streaming alone, it was nice to have other people to just talk while I was focusing on beating the hell out of a uh, cyborg <laughs> who wouldn't let me get a punch in edgewise. But these older games were a couple of hours long, and that was it, right? Mm-hmm. That was the style. That was the design, if you were good at them, and if you could get through them. I remember the first time I played the Simpsons arcade game on Xbox Live with Unlimited Continues and finished it in an hour and went, wait, this game was so much longer growing up. It was because I sucked at it, and it took a lot of time and a lot of quarters. But like that said... It makes for such a fun streaming experience. And while like I may not rush back to keep playing Resident Evil 2 Remake for a whole load of reasons, besides it just being scary <laughs> as hell, is this was a complete experience. We got to go on, do the thing. This was Case's idea. Like, we should stream this game. It's not very long. It'd be a fun companion piece to the episode. And it was, I think, because it's a complete experience under two hours. And like it makes me curious about other beat-em-ups of the time that I loved that took me forever to beat because they were really hard and what it would be like to kind of stream those games 
Because also, something we haven't really said here, so this is based on the comic run, which we did mention, but also at the time, they did this with a lot of other comics, like specifically adapting comic runs. The most famous one, I think, and the better received one is definitely Spider-Man Maximum Carnage, which was an incredibly well-developed and designed game, had multiplayer, and just like aesthetically, like you, the thing that Case is missing here with the bosses, like you got in, in spades in, in that game, like you fought every villain and yeah. even others. Of course, still have the generic thugs, but like it'd be fun to revisit that and talk to some Spider-Man fans or maybe even get Yuri Lowenthal to join me. Right. To talk about this classic game because he's a oh, Spider-Man God, that'd be fan. So fun. Right. And I think this game opened my eyes to that just playing it recently. But also I think even at the time was very much, again, not the best of what had come out, but it's definitely not the worst and it's still really well dedicated to the mm-hmm. source material. And mm-hmm. I think movie tie-ins and like cheap ripoffs were were common at that time too, I'm sure. But I feel like there was more care because Like video games in the early days, like if we didn't have an IP, we need to adapt something, anything. Let's adapt things. And also at the time, you know, it's no secret that Marvel had fluctuations and DC had fluctuations and how profitable they were. So, of course, if a video game company wants to license their characters so they can make a thing, they're going to say, yes, write a paycheck a paycheck. And so (laughs) I think that this is an interesting age from that angle, too, that we'll never get back to, right? Like there are less movie tie-in games now because the industry has realized that creating your own stories with those characters are more successful. Think about the Spider-Man game for PS2 and Miles Morales. We're getting the sequel to that. You know, they're making a Wolverine game. We had the Arkham series. Like we're getting Suicide Squad, which I am not 100% on board with the um, games as a service angle to it. But, you know, that's a different podcast. It's but, sure like, happening, though. It sure is. Uh <laughs> Look, I will say watching that trailer, like the jumping around as King Shark had that kind of Hulk Ultimate Destruction vibe. And I'm here for that. But all of this to say, like, I think developers understand better now that original stories based on the characters we love with a new twist are more successful than like, oh, there's a new Batman game. Got to got to put out that new Batman game for the new Batman movie or whatever else. And mm-hmm. well, and games generally have changed in terms of like how much story there is Mm -hmm. like this game is here's a straight up adaptation of the comic story we're putting it out there but by the time you get to like you like you mentioned hulk ultimate destruction its predecessor was just the movie tie-in for angley's hulk like it's the same engine that just refined and that game like by that point which was ps2 xbox like you already had enough cinematics, you had enough stuff going on that you couldn't just do an adaptation Mm -hmm. of the movie without it being like a derivative product in a way, as opposed to like a um, a transcription of it. Like this comic is taking the story and converting it into a different format. It would feel like a crude translation. Like it would feel like we're adding game elements and then we're going to have like what, like cutscenes that are straight from the movie, either using the actual voice actors or having them just do the same scenes. It would be weird. And like, so Mm -hmm. video games like becoming more advanced have changed the types of stories you would do. And so like the movie tie in game for Hulk was a sequel story. Like it was set up as like, but the events of the movie occurred and then you're following up from there. And like, I think that's roughly when you start to see movie tie-in games be like here's a side story here's a prequel story here's how wolverine gets to this position like here's how you know like all those games are well they're connected they're not doing all the beats from the movie yet but up until that point that had just been kind of the de facto way to do it you know terminator like uh, that's you're experiencing terminator predator games are doing like you're you're doing the stuff theoretically from the from the game you're from the movie that you were watching (laughs) yeah (laughs) So it, it's it's fun to look back at some of these ones where it's like, well, the the craft that's going into it is like, what? How are they adapting it? Like, yeah, it's kind of a middling like beat 'em up game with like some interesting mechanic stuff that they're throwing in there. But then like, here's really cool levels. Here's really cool sprite design. Here, like the the stuff to enjoy isn't the story they're telling. It's mm-hmm. how they're telling the story, yeah. right? Which is an advantage that video games can have. The way that we appreciate the differences in the character design. The way that we see how they set up the fight or how long or short of a level is. Is there a boss there? Who are we fighting? Those are storytelling elements, or they can be if you choose to use them that way. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some of the the meat and potatoes of this game specifically. So you get kind of sort of six Superman to play as in it. Yeah. I say kind of sort of in that you get both Superman in the at the beginning of the game and then at the end of the game you get mullet Superman. It's the same <laughs> yeah. sprite. They just swap the head. And then you've got the four pretenders. And it would have been nice if they had like Supergirl or some other characters in there, especially if they wanted to do two player, mm-hmm. but they, they don't. But it's still like I wanted a booster gold so level, damn it. I did. I really did. <laughs> I wanted a short level where he gets wrecked. 
<laughs> oh, oh, man. Yeah, or Green Lantern at the end would have been also kind yeah. of nice because those also could have had the same basic mechanics. Yeah. You know, just you're punching, but with like a green fist <laughs> instead of like. And what's funny is you both have a much higher and a much lower possibility of that happening if it were made today because now yeah. people would go for the deeper cuts or the deeper immersion but also licensing the characters as individuals gets more expensive mm -hmm. you might have gotten yeah. a better package deal back in 1994 but if you can only do three sprites on screen at a time it's a whole thing so I really liked the general gameplay as Superman, like that actual loop I rather liked. Mm. Like the screen clear attack is probably too strong for to have it be unlimited. And it would have been nicer if you could do it more. But it was always visually impressive, particularly the Eradicators, I think, was my favorite of yes. those. Base Superman and Steel both do the same. They fly up in the air and come down and, and crack the like like crash against the screen and it's all fine. Uh, Cyborg has a grenade, Eradicator flows up into the air. The screen goes black except for his cape, his chest symbol, his uh, glasses, and then the glowing hands. And then just everyone just dies. Uh, <laughs> oh, his glasses don't even glow. He just has kind of like a like Nazgul kind of no oh, face. you're right. You're right. <laughs> Only cowl hands and death. Uh, and then Superboy rises up and the Superboy is kind of lame. It's he, he rises up and his hands flash and the, the screen flickers, which the boy's trying so yeah. hard. <laughs> he's trying there. The, the, he's doing his best. Look at him go. The Eradicator is my favorite for two reasons. One is that it is well, actually three reasons. So one is that it is straight up the the original panel where we first see him from the comics. So it's like a, a perfect reconstruction of it, whereas all the others are just like kind of generic super actions to take. Mm -hmm. Two, it's the fastest of them all, like in terms yeah. of just like he, he floats up really quickly and just like bam, bam, everything, as opposed to like the longer animations of like either throwing the grenade down or flying up into the air. And three, it's the most in character because he's the character <laughs> just burn everyone down with his with his fingertips uh, as opposed to anything else. <laughs> and then in terms of gameplay mechanics, it seemed like the only one I can say for certain is that Steel had better reach than anyone. His mm -hmm. hitbox was clearly wider with his hammer. But then Superboy seemed to attack faster. And then the other characters all seemed about the same in terms of stats. I couldn't really tell. Yeah, a lot of it, I think, is aesthetics. It could be a trick of the animations. It's unclear what the advantages are. And with a game like this, when the Internet wasn't really a thing when it was out, it's harder to find that information, although I'm sure it's been researched to death now. Maybe. But yeah, I, I like the the aesthetics for sure. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but like just the difference between the characters gave the game enough variety that I never felt bored. I mean, I also didn't feel bored because of the way we were streaming it, but like, I like that all of the screen clears, all of the ranged attacks, all of the little things made each character feel like their own, even in a game where it was like kind of just a generic beat em up as a through line. Yeah. When last night when you got to the cyborg stage or like which is the first Superman you play, like I you had noticed like just how different the character all of a sudden was like instead of heat vision, yeah. he had a gun for a hand. And, you know, like the animations were notably different, like Superman doesn't really kick. But then Cyborg and Eradicator both have a lot of kicks in their portfolio. Mm -hmm. Eradicator has that really cool pile driver throw where he like flies up into the air and then like slams him into the yeah. ground. Superboy had like a lot of like really cool like flips and stuff. While the enemies don't change up that much, like at least your your <laughs> fighting motions do, which was like a yeah. good <laughs> a good band aid for it all. It feels different, at least. Yeah. Also, we talked about this a little before, but the different nods to the comic book are there too. Like J Mike kept joking about um, Cyborg Superman sneak attacks, and every boss fight <laughs> that you fight him, which there are several, after you quote unquote defeat him. You like knock him off screen and then he comes back and like pot shots you off screen and then walks back over to you like he gets in that sneak attack. And I think that's really funny. Like, again, even with the limits of the narrative storytelling, they they kind of put in those moments. They're just very fun and kind of goofy. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't notice them, you don't notice them. And if you do notice them, cool. They're quick. Yeah. And it's fun that you get to fight most of these characters as a boss at some point. Like Steel is a, a fight that Eradicator has to go through, which is a fight that happens in the comics. And then Cyborg obviously mm -hmm. is the main villain of the story. So he ends up being a boss battle for Spoilers. multiple characters. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. And actually, I think kind of all of them, because you fight a version of the Cyborg when you're Steel, even though it's like him, like projecting his face into like the, the walls of, uh, of Injun City. So really, every character fights him in some capacity. It would have been kind of cool to actually have Supergirl show up. It's kind of like a guardian angel type deal yeah. that shields you from like lethal attacks occasionally. 
<laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that just from a general design standpoint, like how you could do like easy modes in games like this, where because like the uh, the Superboy level is straight from his first appearance in the Adventures of Superman, and in that sequence in the comics where he's like literally walking down this gang infested street, and it feels very video gamey in the comic as it is. Um, he's actually being protected by the Guardian. Guardian is like up and taking out snipers and like preventing like different situations from like hitting Superboy, and like not to say he couldn't have succeeded but it's he even comments in the comic it's like it feels like i'm on easy mode right now which again in a later game or a different or more development time or whatever what a ridiculous idea for an escort mission where you're playing as the guardian <laughs> and like you're pac-man toing this shit and Superboy's just having a fun sunny day walking down the street and you're taking out all the threats before they can get <laughs> yeah, well i mean like think about that like where it like you can bring a certain number of assist characters with you and they're just acting in the background to prevent certain like to take out certain elements that you'd have to face. I'm thinking of things like in Mega Man X2, where there's like that level where the, it keeps scanning you and the boss gets harder depending on how many times it scans you. Like if instead of the scanning mechanism, it was like, all right, well, I've got X number of people assisting. So even though it's not a team game or like they're like, it's technically making it easier and you could make it harder by having fewer of them, fewer of them selected like Supergirl. Right. It's almost like an item. Yeah, exactly. Like Supergirl yeah. helping in like engine city, for example, would also be the same situation. So it could be like, mm -hmm. here's, here's your, it's like a reverse escort mission. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I hate keep, to keep comparing it to Maximum Carnage, but clearly it's my favorite of these kinds of games. Right. But like they had they had characters. Yeah, they, they had helpers, yeah. And a bunch of other Morbius mm -hmm. and like you could summon them in and they would like screen clear essentially. And so this sounds like a similar idea, like you could pick up a bunch of different assists and then trigger them to come in and either screen clear or protect you or give you limited vulnerability thing in vulnerability, things like that. And I think. That would have been a fun addition to this. But again, as we were talking before, resources are limited on a cartridge like this. And they already had a lot of stuff on screen. So I think adding yeah. might have been a challenge oh, totally. even if it were for limited. But I mean, that's that's just a common beat em up thing. I mean, you think about the special attacks that you had in Streets of Rage or even in Scott Pilgrim more recently. You call in Knives Chow yep. to attack for you and stuff like I think that J Mike, this idea makes sense logically because it was just so core to this style of game at the time and it is a little surprising that it's not actually in this probably budgetary restrictions right my and guess, or, yeah and our lack of space on that two megabyte drive <laughs> <laughs> ridiculous you can do a lot on two megabytes sega genesis game sometimes got as small as 128 kilobytes well and like that's the thing those games sucked but they could do it <laughs> i mean i mean so i think we, like we talked about this on the stream that the game being on both super nintendo and genesis meant that they couldn't pull out all the stops to get the tricks to get the game down because they were developing for two different architectures like this yeah. isn't like a castle of illusions where it's like i can't get over how you fit this game onto this cartridge kind of thing <laughs> no and comparing the two a little bit like i said the snes version has a few more scrolling layers in the background the music is a little different it, the genesis soundtrack sounds like genesis yeah which that's again to your taste how do you feel about fm synthesis well there you go <laughs> Yeah. It does what Nintend don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Matt, since you were the one playing it, which of the Supermen did you have the most fun actually controlling? The classic Superman was fun just because I'm like, I love classic Superman of the Superman. But I would say that the easiest control was Eradicator because that's special move and just the way he attacked. But also, I think I had the most fun with Steel just because he's kind of the broadest, biggest of the characters and like having that hammer was very much like playing Donatello in the old Ninja Turtles, which I think you made that comparison on stream, like just having the reach yeah. uh, made, made some stuff easier, but honestly, because of the flying assholes and everything else, like it, it made some things easier and other things harder because he is slow and more purposeful. So mm -hmm. I think steel was my favorite and still happens to be one of my favorites of the Superman, but yeah. And then the classic, like also, especially in the last stage when you like reunite with Eradicator and become the full Superman and got go to that last level, even though he plays identically, there's something about that kind of reinvigoration that was fun to like play out at the end of that game. Yeah. I think one thing that they dropped the ball on is that pure Superman should have been like a little bit more powerful. Like the first couple levels are weirdly hard compared to most of the levels as like when you're playing the imposters and it would have been really yeah. fun if the easy mode was that first like two levels where you're playing a Superman until Doomsday shows up. And then when you get him at the end, he's back to being like full power. And it's like, oh, I've been missing this because of the imposters just are, you know, each one shades less than the original. Yeah. yeah, a sort of taste of power thing, which games have been doing forever. And 
I haven't gotten tired of it yet. Yeah, I mean, look, they do it in literally every Metroid game. Samus loses all her powers. <laughs> and every time it's a different reason. And every time we go, yeah, sure, that's fine. Well, I mean, it's better than just like the start of Super Metroid where it's like, eh, I just didn't have it with me. <laughs> <laughs> I got here as soon as I could. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like fusion and dread, it's life threatening situations that cause it. Like, it's just it's fine. It is what it is. Um, oh, actually, I think Metroid Prime also does like he you almost get killed and then you lose all your right. powers. It's yep. it's fine. It is what it is. But yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that, um, I mean, I think it would also have made it feel more Superman, right? Like mm -hmm. because of the kind of power creep in the DC universe, it's just fun for Superman to be powerful, but you only can f really feel that if you lack that power for a period of time. Right. Yes. And that also plays into the idea of these four different figures showing up, to try to fill the gap one way or another, or certainly in people's hearts and playing as them, you, what a great way to feel the lack. Like that's again, cool storytelling. Yeah. Although then the weird part is that you play as <laughs> the two most powerful of the pretenders for the largest <laughs> share of those levels. Like you start with cyborg and then you spend quite a bit of time as eradicator. Uh, and both of them are like, Eradicator is arguably like pound for pound in the same weight class as Superman. And then Cyborg is just Superman, but upgraded. So in both scenarios, it's like, oh, well, that's not quite the, that scenario. But <laughs> Steel is definitely weaker and Superboy is also definitely weaker. Mm -hmm. So it would have been fun to like open with those two characters a little bit more. Sure. Uh, and both of those would have yeah. justified like street levels and stuff. But uh, economy Agreed. of storytelling here. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. And because each of the stages, you don't get to choose who you play as you are locked into whichever character you could design the levels around those power sets and showcasing the similarities and differences. The idea of, yes, the storyline is three decades old. A lot of us know the twists and turns, even just the larger ones. But you can still play it up a little bit like, is the cyborg Superman the real Superman? He seems to have Kryptonian DNA, you know, all this stuff. You can have fun with that and des design to what you're doing. You run into difficulty sometimes if it's, well, you can choose who you need to be, so you need to be able to do this with everybody. No, you are Superboy in this level. How do we make that a Superboy level is questions that need to be answered, and they might not have had the time or the vocabulary to do that. We are looking at this nearly 30 years on. Yeah, but I was impressed with how they, they brought some of those story points into the levels. Oh, yeah. Let's shift from characters to stages like what Matt, particularly for you, since you were the one streaming it like stages that stood out. Like what was your what was your favorite? And then what was like one that was just like an interesting way to do that in this game? So, I mean, the stages, what was really great is the amount of detail they put in. Right. Like you could very much just kind of have a static background in these games and not do anything. But like we commented on how like the night sky in certain stages looked really cool. The cityscape when playing as Superman, I think in the second level. But I think my favorites was when Coast City was burning. Like when we, whenever we were there, the like red kind of yeah, fiery yes. sky that you yeah. often saw in Contra Alien Wars on the same console, like that kind of a like swirling effect was really cool and like the destructed rubble around you all of that looked really neat gave you the feeling of devastation which you don't always feel in those games i think that the last stage is steel when you're kind of like flying through to fight uh, in the machine city like there's just so much going on it's so busy but it's kind of cool the intricacies in the background that you can see and all the stuff going on those probably are the two that are top of mind for yeah me. i would agree that the coast city burning stage is visually the the most aesthetically pleasing of them all like just the color of red they okay. chose for the night sky like looks so ominous and yeah like it like had this radioactive quality to it that was like it burned my eyes but in a way that it, it burned my eyes the way that like buffalo wings burned my mouth in a way that i really like <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. And it had a really good elements going on, like the destruction spheres that they used to like actually bomb the city were like on the ground. And the, like those are things that were like dropping in the comics. And it was really like, really cool that those were then the mines that you could step on and they would explode and they would leave craters in the ground after you stepped on them that lingered, which, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. And then there were just skeletons everywhere. Like it's a really grim setting. Yeah, so cool. it suddenly became a horror game almost in terms of the <laughs> backdrop. Yeah. And I mentioned the Cadmus level also looked really good in terms of like translating that all the engine city stuff looked pretty cool. It looked, it looked very contra -y once you were like in it, like there was some really nice like purple and green, like mm -hmm. glowing levels going on there that, you know, looked like generic alien level in a video game, but like worked really well here. 
those I thought were all good. Obviously, the game is mostly a beat em up. So like there's a certain amount of like, well, it's just kind of a backdrop while you walk in a three quarter overhead perspective from left to right. But I did rather enjoy that they mixed up the game. The fact that their shooting stages was really cool, like using Cadmus flying security guards, which are like that the cyborg Superman encounters to like be like, here's why you have a shooter level like that was pretty cool. The Superboy level where he's fighting the missile, I thought was a really good translation and subtly changing the narrative from the comic in a way that made it more video game. Like in the comics, Superboy's hanging on to the missile and fighting for dear life to deflect it like he's but he's never like it's on him trying to like catch it and deal with like lasers that are shooting at him because he's trying to blow up the orbs that are attached to it to make it like a less powerful <laughs> mm-hmm. payload. But the struggle is a very like Superman type struggle where he's like literally like pressing up against it the way Superman's like stopping a train kind of thing and trying to push it away. You know, it's, it's very similar to the uh, Superman Returns airplane sequence or the uh, the similar sequence in the pilot for the animated series Superman. But here in this game, he's trying to catch up to it. He is attacking the gun turrets that are on it. He's trying to hit the rockets like it was a very video gamey level in a way that I thought was really uh, like pleasing and still fit the narrative in the same way. But it was better for a video game than if you were trying to like push a rocket out of the way like that wouldn't have worked as a video game. It's more dramatic in a comic or it would have been a dramatic right. like sequence in a movie. But like this translation was like, OK, it's different, but the same in all the ways that count. And I really like that. I'm now thinking of our conversation yesterday of just adapting Superman into older arcade games. And I'm just now imagining <laughs> Superboy Missile Command. <laughs> his, his sprite is so tiny and he's just flying around just trying to like knock these things out of the yeah, way. Yeah, our conversation last night where it's like, well, what if Mongol basically acted as <laughs> like as Donkey Kong was like one of the great conversation points? Yes. there's a lot one can do and they didn't have yeah they didn't have that at the time and you know none of us have ever actually made a video game we have varying amounts of understanding of the difficulties and intricacies of game development but we can all just sit here from our our chairs this might be a good point to bring up like things that were missing from the story that would have been nice i i kept on venting during it that i wish mongol was a boss fight in this in this game, mostly because in the comic, he is one of the yeah. two bosses that they deal with. <laughs> like, the fact that War World guides everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Like he's everywhere except the actual game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, also so just more yeah. boss fights in general, like you were saying, Case, like, you know, we get we get a couple in the in the beginning and then from there, most of the bosses are other Supermen or then the giant face of Cyborg Superman. But it would have been cool to have Mongol or even maybe teaming up with the Justice League members to fight certain people like you fight Doomsday twice. But like having other bosses or even making up some bosses like create like they created a robot boss on one stage, the Cadmus stage, and then didn't really do anything with that. Even like they could have just like given us a really strong looking biker punk to fight. I don't know, like just literally yeah. anything. Well, actually, like the big thing is that they were missing characters that should have been there to be boss fights. And then they invented stuff like the drone, like the drone could have been like Aron, uh, which is like a super advanced clone of Guardian that Mm -hmm. they had introduced in that story arc or just something from Cadmus. But like, I don't get that mad that the drone was there, but I get mad that the drone was there, but we didn't get things again. Mongol's the big one. But like there's there's so many like little fights that occur throughout the whole thing. Like Guy Gardner could have been a really fun fight for the Eradicator at one point. (laughs) I will say it's probably good that they didn't have. Have, uh, Cyborg Superman save Bill Clinton uh, in this game because that would have <laughs> that would have made this even more of a time I mean, capsule. <laughs> Bill Clinton's shown up in games before. This is the thing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But yeah, like Stinger, the uh, the Spider Man knockoff that uh, that Superboy fights would have been a really fun boss mm-hmm. encounter. Actually, that would have been really fun, like making fun of um, of like all the Spider Man video oh, games yeah, at the yeah. time. If that was actually <laughs> what was going on, like if he played just like Maximum Carnage Spider Man, <laughs> and that's just like beat up Spider Man now or yeah. Superboy. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what was going on in the zeitgeist at the time. I mean, yeah, I'm trying to remember that DC versus Marvel, the matchups. Was this Spider Man versus? It was Spider Man versus Superboy. Right, that's right. And that worked really well because it was Ben Riley at the time. So they were mm. both clones, which was really fun. And then when they did the amalgam between the two of them, they could have nods to both like classic Silver Age Superboy and Spider Man stuff. And then also the clone stuff specifically for Ben Riley and for Connell. Or really the kid, because he wasn't Connell yet. He, he wouldn't be Connell until like 97, 98, something like that. Hmm. And then like 2002 was when he became Connor. <laughs> <laughs> Fun. Yeah, Mongol's the big one. Green Lantern would have been fun to be there just because Coast City is his city. But I do get that, like, having all these characters might be a bit extra. Uh, maybe. Yeah. I mean, maybe. I still would love to see it. 
<laughs> Jay Mike, so like I have subjected you to now months of the death and return of Superman stuff. Is there any big thing that stands out that you wish was in this game? I mean, I wish we could have gotten to see a little thing with head and shoulders, Fabio Lex <laughs> Luthor, like a little screenshot. <laughs> And I, like I said, I, I do wish like Supergirl would have been here as like an assist trophy type deal. Yeah. But other than that, from the stories, I think they pretty much covered what they needed to with this game. We don't need like all the other side characters. It, it is a product of his yeah. time. <laughs> this is uh, 94. Yeah. Super Nintendo game was 94. Yeah, it was 94. I was yeah. five. I'm so old. <laughs> Ain't we all? I mean, I, yeah, something I, that came up in the stream a bunch, J. Mike, that I, f- I feel like you agreed with is that there was not enough Bibbo representation. Yeah. Thank you. I was yes. about to say that. Yes, I was like, they could have. You could have. You could have. Like, you were fighting as Superman, I guess, or actually even Steel. You could have had like a, like a store that you passed by that has I forget the name of Bibbo's restaurant. You could have had like that as like one of like the little little Easter egg things that you're fighting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that you're fighting outside of as yeah. you're going down the street. That would have been cool as a little cool reference. But I think they did a pretty good job of, of keeping it small. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> without like doing too much. The largest, most epic story that they were trying to tell in comics at the time. Two megabytes. On two megabytes. <laughs> right. <laughs> they did their best. And you know what? When Which you was... consider those constraints, very well done. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. said, yeah. I think yeah. this reviewed poorly because of how damn difficult it was. I think removing that makes it a pretty fun time. I mean, it was made to eat quarters. <laughs> right. On a console right. that didn't use quarters. It was made to eat exactly. rentals. <laughs> it, yeah. It, it was just this transitional game design thing. Like if we also were inundated with these types of beat em ups and like now that it is not a genre that is so domineering, we can go back and be like, oh, yeah, like it's fun to play these every now and then, especially like removed from it all. Yeah. Like at the time, again, like I, I beat it with codes. And I think that that is an experience that like people undervalue sometimes just like going through and seeing the whole of the game. It's the reason why people watch like Let's Plays. Like sometimes you just want to see what the game looks like and not necessarily need to deal with like the difficulty, like the arbitrarily high difficulty of the the video game. A lot of those moves were so cheap. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) The Molotov guys. Oh my God. From across the room with pinpoint accuracy. It's like, come on. (laughs) Yeah. The dude with the claws. Listen, if you cheap. are going to take the name Molotov in the gang, you better, your game better be on point. That's true. That's true. <laughs> you know, if, if you're going to be the guy who throws knives in the heavy artillery gang, you better be superhuman with those knives. And maybe they're superhuman with the Molotov. I don't know. Yeah. Comic books. That's true. Yeah. Like secretly, he actually has like very limited fire powers. So he does like he doesn't have a lighter. He just like has the Molotov cocktails, and then like with his fingers, like sets the fire to the to the yeah. rag that's like hanging just out. Just a little spark. As much as he can do, more than you can do. Yeah, superpowers. <laughs> yeah, my superpower is that my fingertip creates a fire the exact size of a Zippo lighter. Is that that useful in combat? No. Is it useful for camping? Right. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, oh, man, those Molotov guys would have been perfect for a <laughs> level. Exactly. Com- coming out to <laughs> fend the bar. <laughs> Superman. Favorite hero. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like Superman a, a, a now. Bibbo and Dan Turpin level. <laughs> like, and it becomes streets of, it just, it just becomes full on streets yeah. of rage at that point. That'd be amazing. <laughs> you know what? And I've been looking at this. I'm, I'm not disappointed, nor am I surprised. This is a lie. I'm a little disappointed, but I'm not surprised that the only ROM hack that exists for the death and return of Superman is an invincibility hack. Yeah. So, you know, you could really yeah. feel like Superman or we can just use a game genie. But I feel like if we're ever going to get anything like this, <laughs> ROM hacking. And I don't know how deep that goes either, but it's probably out there. In the subconscious. Yeah, I would love to see a ROM hack where they took assets from the Justice League Task Force. That's exactly what I was checking, actually. I'm like, these are my tabs right now. Yeah, and just like opened up the levels a little bit. Because there are some spots where it's like, well, it's cool that you can behave this way, but the game is already like, it's cool that you can fly. Like the flying mechanics are actually rather like satisfying in this game. Once you get used to like, make sure you only double tap jump and don't triple tap by accident because the the third one makes you fall. And the heat vision powers slash like blaster powers to like stun foes and then move in quickly for attacks. Like those are satisfying game loops that the game doesn't, 
teach you enough to do or reward you enough really once you get it down like mm-hmm. your jump attack's really good your flying is how you can move across the screen really fast or just avoid foes the stunning part is like cool especially once the the motorcycle guys or like the flying drone guy not the not the flyers that like shoot from above but like the when like a bad guy is riding on like a space mm-hmm. bike or whatever the heat vision or your blaster power is the way to knock them down and like those are all like very fun little moments that I wish the game built more on and then didn't have stages like where you're on like a city street and you're just like walking and then a building is just like in your way. <laughs> you got to leave them tall buildings in a single bound. <laughs> Why Are you even way? Superman? <laughs> 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 which that is cool but it's like so weird that it's just like oh yeah we're rocking down broadway up oh, we we've, we've stumbled at the building that's directly at the center of broadway okay <laughs> pretty much yeah but but those game mechanics are pretty good and i would have i would have really liked a game that like fleshed those out a little bit more i like that we get those shooter levels those are cool i like i really like this the steel level where he's flying around and he's actually using his hammer as opposed to his mm-hmm. gun while he's flying like that feels like a, a cool level that is very difficult to avoid the attacks. And if it was a little bit more labyrinthian, like if you actually had to like explore a bit in that flying mode, that would have been really cool. Like, could you imagine a Metroidvania set in like Engine City uh, where you're like Superman, like <laughs> especially black suit Superman getting powers as you. Oh, man, that's a, that is a game right there. Yeah, it's, it's you with the gun. It's the, it's the zero suit Samus part of Metroid Zero Mission. Yeah. Yeah, you get that and steel mm-hmm. as your two characters that you can like swap between and they have different capabilities and like Superman gets powers up, or like powered mm-hmm. up as he goes. Cool ideas that you that come from this game. Like this game has like all these like it, the, the art assets are so good. There's several things about the gameplay that I really like, but then it's just kind of arbitrarily hard. And it's like you can't avoid shots very easily. Like the, st- the shooter levels we noted, like there's no way to be like better at them. You just kind of tank it. And like either you have enough lives to get through it or you don't because like there's there's no way to avoid them. Like you if you shot down every single one, you're still going to take one shot per like wave yeah. of enemies. So like some of those levels, they're just more waves than others. And like you're still going to get taken out by it all. So the game is actually rather pretty. And that's the biggest reason to play through it all. And like the storytelling is like pretty good and it's like kind of fun to play, but it's not at no point does it make you feel like you have gotten good and thus rewarded for getting good. It just feels like, oh, well, it's just more of this game. I I completely agree. Yeah, but it was rather fun to, to play through again. Like it's a game that I didn't feel the need to buy at the time, even though I was like, obsessed with 90 Superboy um, because it was like, yeah, once you played through it, you've sure played, played through that it. game and it was cool to come back to it 30 years later. Yeah, totally. No, it was a great idea to play it on stream and I had a lot of fun <laughs> with it, but uh, but it is sure a game that I'm like, I'm, I, I think I'm good for the rest of my life to never play it again, but I enjoyed my time with it. <laughs> Gasp. <laughs> you know, maybe maybe in 30 years when you're when you're pushing 70 and you're like, oh, this will like I remember back in my day. Excuse you. I would be 69 in 30 years. <laughs> nice. That's why I said pushing. I didn't say you were 70. <laughs> <laughs> But oh, back, no. in, back in my day, I was able to play as the Metropolis Kid. <laughs> <laughs> this was a lot of fun to rewatch. I would totally do this again. And like I like we were saying with other like comic book games or just like property mm-hmm. games. I think yeah. that's like the big part where it's an adaptation of a thing that's really fun. Like like the Simpsons like beat em up is like a really fun one for similar reasons. And we were talking about this on Discord for other reasons today where it's like, oh, yeah, look at like all the assets that they took from this exact snapshot of like season one slash season two Simpsons. Like, here's yeah. the stuff. And like like what other games have changed as a result of like time like Wildcats is a very different property than when the video game came out or Spawn is a very different property mm-hmm. now like actually I take that back well, let's play them edgy boy beat em up <laughs> games from the comics yeah uh, like there are so many like fun adaptations and it's like okay well how did they adapt this at this time what you know what is the cool art what is the what are the fun easter eggs mm-hmm. they're putting in there like what are all those things as opposed to like really focusing on the gameplay stuff because like it's sometimes just fun to be like oh that was a creative thing that they did at this moment they didn't have to be creative here but they were in the spot and it's like yeah, those are cool sure. yeah. And this was a good game for that. Like, it, it's definitely not a game that I need to play repeatedly, but it was certainly a fun one to, like, revisit and be like, oh, that's a really cool shade of red. Yeah. <laughs> like, on that level. It's, it's a useful <laughs> historical piece. Yeah. I, I would definitely recommend anyone who is listening to this episode who has not played through the game or seen it or even played through it recently, check out the YouTube video. Like, it looks yeah. – it's really cool. I think our conversation was really fun yeah. during the oh, whole yeah. thing. Watch our playthrough. Yeah. And or, you know, you could play it yourself by totally legal ma- means on the Internet like I did on my very special Super Nintendo. You can still get a copy of the game. It's out there. Out there in the wild somewhere. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Uh, yeah. So I I had a really good time with this. I'm, I'm glad that we did this all. It was a lot of fun last night. I think people should check out that stream. I think that this is a fun postmortem from from that stream. I think that looking back at that, this is how I was first given the story of the death and return of Superman. I understand looking back. This is why I was confused by Closter versus Doomsday because they yep. look the fucking same. But it gets the beats really well. Like it completely sidesteps a bunch of story arcs. Like it, the whole world without Superman is gone. Superboy, you don't even play until like the last like quarter mm-hmm. of the game. Like Steel, same deal, except he's a boss before that. But it does get all the big beats. It gets the whole cyborg. But cyborg shows up and betrays everyone kind of story. And like Co City is gone. And, yeah. you know, cyborg betrayed the Eradicator. And then he betrays mm-hmm. Superboy. And then <laughs> it just goes. And all that. <laughs> yeah. And then Superman shows up again, except you don't get the giant robot that he like pilots for whatever reason you just have them show up immediately in metropolis and then they go to co city and yeah. <laughs> they, they get this they, again they get the big beats across really well and that that is actually impressive that they could tell that story so quickly when when we try to do it on the podcast it took Correct. us seven hours yeah <laughs> just goes to show i guess <laughs> so thank you both for for participating in this matt and jeff thank you for having us yeah pleasure. <laughs> matt so this is your second episode where you are not the editor, but uh, we're coming off of you being the editor for all of this. And like, what was there anything that really stood out to you from just like listening to us talk for so goddamn long about the story arc that really stuck out when you I were mean, playing I this guess game? Just the nuance of the of the storyline. Like, I, I again, I if I've read this whole run, it was a long time ago. I haven't read it recently for sure. And so there were a lot of smaller details about Bibbo and about the Eradicator and about all these different characters, both the Superman and others, that I just, I didn't really know or remember, you know, or even the Guardian and stuff like that. And these characters that were kind of created for this run and to, to diversify this world while Superman was, quote unquote, dead, sleeping, taking a nap. And... Uh, <laughs> It was just really fun to kind of learn that. I mean, a lot of my comic book knowledge, especially related to Superman, Shazam, and anything adjacent has come from editing the show because I don't read a lot of comics anymore. I used to. And, like, I recently got the Matt Fraction Hawkeye run as a omnibus that I'm excited to read and excited to take a year and a half to read it because I just I just don't sit down and read comics or books that often anymore. They're not my premium choice of entertainment above uh, video games and music. And I'm just slower at it. I'm not a speed reader on any level. But that said, this this show, while editing it, was a great resource for learning that. And it will continue to be. I'm excited to be a listener again of your show's case because I like them very much. <laughs> but once I've edited them, I am not re-listening to them. F that. Because <laughs> editing them is basically listening to them at least a dozen times. Yeah. In practice. Yeah. So it's like, you know, folks ask, do you listen to side quests? No, I edit all of them and they are not long and I don't feel a need to revisit them. But sometimes I'll re-listen to like episodes of funny games or screen snarker stuff because like I don't edit those shows for one. And and secondly, like we bank, especially funny games, we bank far enough back. And I'm like, what did I say? <laughs> right. Well, I don't remember what this conversation went, that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's just it's been fun to learn a lot more about Superman, a character that for a long time I was just like, ah, oh, he's cheating. He's invulnerable. And like to get to learn his nuance and stuff has been really great. Because he is a really interesting and diverse character. And also, like, for me to not like Superman as a Jew also <laughs> felt, felt wrong after a while. Like, I feel like I'm required. It's, it's, it's just he is an analog for my people. And so I don't think that there's, like, a favorite moment. But, like, or, you know, reaffirming. Uh, actually, here's my favorite moment from the run. Reaffirming that Guy Gardner is an asshole and he's also the worst <laughs> Green Lantern. Come for me, dudes. I'm an old school Hal Jordan fan. I'll keep saying it. We'll fight you all. Yeah, that is the... That is the one thing I really wish was in this game, which is that if Eradicator fighting Guy Gardner and Guy Gardner being like, man, you really are the real Superman. I, I trust you. And then he's like, Guy Gardner, like, I, what have I done? Fuck, are we the baddies? Now, if this were like a fighting game and it's like the Street Fighter, like break the car, it's just beat up Guy Gardner. Yeah. Break Guy Gardner. Yeah. That's cruel. Yeah. Uh Jeff, you uh, you had read this long ago, but but coming into it, like, did you do any prep for this game or were were you just like pleasantly surprised to be reminded of stuff? Basically when you're watching that it? Like, I wanted to go into this a little blind once I knew that Matt was playing. If I was going to be the one playing, I'm like, let me do my research. But I've done most of my research between the finishing of the stream and this, recording this episode, which has been fun. But I wanted to see how much I remembered. I wanted to see how much struck me as a a clear nod to the story. 
which is very helpful chatting with y'all. But I wanted to judge it on its merits as, like, yeah, the idea of, I just rented this from Blockbuster. What have I got? And what we got was a middling beat-em-up that had a lot of clear love in it and is, yeah, a very worthwhile YouTube watch. I think it's a good historical uh, deep dive. And it's probably a shorter watch than most listens of any episode of this podcast. So, you yes, know, you're, you're in <laughs> good shape there. <laughs> Yes, yes. I well, we're, we'll be wrapping this, this up in a moment. I'm really happy that this that we did this game. It was like really fun to like go back to it. Like again, like it's it is visually yeah. pleasing. Like that, I think is the mm-hmm. biggest thing going. I'm for a sucker it. Like, for sprite art. It'll always be my preference to polygons, as I've expressed many a time. And the they the sprite work in this game was absolutely impressive, more than I expected for sure, without a doubt. Like it's not quite as like big and bold as like a Final Fight arcade game, but it's. Doing pretty good for a Super Nintendo game, especially a two meg Super Nintendo game. Two, two meg of power. Yeah, I think if they were able to break the repetitive nature of it, whether it were different sprites, a different sort of level design, whatever, I think this could have really elevated it. But we got what we got. Yeah. Like, this is a game that really, like, I wish I could do, like, another <laughs> pass on because right? it's so, like, there, there, because there's so many good elements to it all. And, like, it's, as it is, it's in the upper echelon of Superman video <laughs> games, like, especially, like, pure <laughs> Superman. Such a low, such low, low bar. Like, yeah, low bar. Right. <laughs> And yet he clears it like because like yeah, we, we brought true. up Injustice before, but like that's not technically a Superman game, even if it's a very Superman focused, no, it, like Justice League game. Mm-hmm. And so like if we're looking at pure Superman games, like I'm not going to say this is the best, but it is, like I said, on the upper echelon of it all. Like we've talked in the past and we, we've been meaning to do more video game stuff with you guys to do Superman games. But, you know, this is one that stuck out mm-hmm. for me because it's one that I had access to in a time where I knew a lot about the character as opposed to like the Superman arcade game, which like I I have played once or twice in like later life, but like wasn't a very early introduction for me to Superman. But I, I just didn't know as much about the comics at the time. So I couldn't even tell you like what's going on in there. That would be like Superman like trivia or like what fun in those regards. Cause it's like from like 89 or something like that. And like, it's just a very different kind of game. It is wild thinking about how much of my comic knowledge starts with video games. Cause Spider-Man happens the same way for me. Like the Spider-Man arcade game was a big way for me to get into the character. And like I said, this is how I first experienced the death and return of Superman story. And it does a pretty good job of telling that story. Yeah, mm. I agree. J Mike, before we go, is there anything that stands out to you that we haven't mentioned? Um, I think we have most of the story beats. Game looked aesthetically pleasing for its time. <laughs> I would give this, I want to say one of the best, if not the best Superman iteration in a video game, I think. I mean, I'm inclined to agree because the only other Superman games I can think of are Superman Returns, which yeah, is I think bad. This is the, Superman I think this 64, is the, which is really bad. The mountaintop with this game. But, uh... <laughs> got to do a replay of the yeah. arcade game at some point and then see if that how that one yeah. holds up that's the only one i could imagine that is anywhere near better yeah, i think good. we hit everything now uh, i think we, i think we hit everything yeah. pretty pretty bad yeah oh god as long as you don't make me play superman 64 <laughs> case i think we're good <laughs> no we'll put we'll make matt play superman 64. We'll play shadow of apocalypse <laughs> yeah right exactly i'm i'm the sucker here i'm gonna be playing all the bad superman i games. would not let you do that to him <laughs> <laughs> well if we if we did we would find cheat codes to, to make it not there is not possible it controls like the problem is the literal control of the game <laughs> unless you can make someone play it for me there is no way to make that game better it's just Isn't it not also possible. the timer factor yeah. you're like yeah. dying from kryptonite gas so yeah, like if you yeah. I, there, there's probably a cheat code to remove that at least maybe i mean cheat codes weren't as common by the time we got to playstation n64 there was game shark but like they they there weren't were. like the pro action replay and the game genie were just not as ubiquitous like right. the early game genie. Well, were. well, usually you look up cheat codes, you're gonna find the yeah, action replay sure. or the game shark codes. But but that said, we're we're probably not gonna spend that. <laughs> No. Don't, you, don't you do it, Case? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's not the first on our priority list in terms of other things to play. For sure not. For, for sure this. not. And, and, and it's not like we do get video games that frequently on the show, but this was a lot of fun. I, I'm really glad that we did that stream. I really recommend people check out that YouTube video. I think that was a lot of fun. I hope we do this again. Me too. I think yeah, it was like good. just a ton of fun being like, yeah, for two hours, we're just going to look at something weird. Yeah. And it's it, it was fun really glad that this idea that we had been like thrown around for like like six ish months actually happened so thank you both for being here matt thank you for all your time putting up with all of my bullshit um 
I, and Jeff, I am so sorry for all the time <laughs> you're about to deal with my bullshit. <laughs> it's uh, truth, justice. I don't know. It's it's that'll be fun. <laughs> a certain POV I say way. now. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Love it. All right. So before we go, give your give your plugs. Yeah, you can find me personally on Twitter at Jeff Makes Noise. Jeff is G-E-O-F-F. You can also find me on Twitch uh, with the same name. As far as podcasts go, you can hear me on the Certain POV Network as part of the Fun and Games podcast, along with Stormageddon here. It is a conversational show about the culture, the history, the future of video games. We've had a lot of fun guests on. It's all about the celebration of gaming and what it can be and what it is for us. It's bringing your personal history through the lens of gaming. You can find me on that aforementioned show as well. You can also find a link to, which I'm sure Case will include in the show notes because I'm calling him out now, to our brand new Patreon, which Jeff and I started at the beginning of the year. It is to literally help support the podcast. All of the money goes right back into it. We have some incredible supporters already, like one said Case Aiken at the $10 level, but literally at any level that you can give. It's literally patreon.com slash fun and games pod. And literally at any level, we appreciate the help and the support. We're so grateful for our audience and those who are already supporting also rate and review not only this podcast you're currently listening to but fun and games as well because that also helps and costs you nothing but three minutes of your time you can literally go five stars great good show and then just move on you don't even have funky chicken exactly besides that the best place to find me while it still exists is on twitter.com dj underscore stormageddon I also do a bunch of other podcasts. I host an interview series called CPOV Autographs that recently shifted to monthly. I host uh, Screen Snark with the incredible Rachel Quirky Shank, which is a TV movie pod uh, that all of these folks have been on at one point or another. Also, of course, we just started season five of Reignite. Uh, Frankie and I are taking on the Dragon Age franchise now. We are done with Mass Effect until Mass Effect 5 eventually comes out, which I am tentatively very nervous about, but we'll see how that goes. But we are starting with Dragon Age Origins. We are, as of when this comes out, like uh, three or four episodes in. And it's been a good time. It's fun to switch genres, switch games. I'm curious to see how this one evolves since the Mass Effect run over four seasons did change quite a bit. And so this is a new new way to head out. And then, of course, I'm the editor for the Game Informer show, which is an incredible podcast from the folks over at Game Informer. I've been reading that magazine since I was a kid. So to be the editor for the show is kind of neat. Alex Van Aken is an incredible host, and they talk about the latest gaming news. And then in the playlist, what games they've been playing, I've been on a bunch of times. Uh, so you can start with those episodes if you're looking for a good place to jump in. And it's definitely worth checking out. And then, like, I do a ton of other shit, too. So just DJ underscore Storm again on Twitter are the best places to find me. I am a little disappointed that you jump ship from this Aiken to the lesser Aiken, <laughs> but I understand. <laughs> uh, spelled differently, actually. I know, I know. Uh, they, <laughs> and if any Superman game is one of your favorites, the Fun and Games podcast feed does also feature a show called SideQuest that is yes. different hosts talking about their favorite game, people in and out of the video games industry. And oh, if God. Superman 64 is your favorite game and you really want to talk about it, by all means, it's about celebration of gaming. Yeah. And if you appreciate other sorts of deep dives into other nerdy properties i also edit the gum jabbar podcast on lore party network yes yeah which is a great show that i'm also a patron for <laughs> you are all i hear your name all the time case. i hear I say, who is this case aiken <laughs> yeah you spread the love this around this hatterack about you. patron of gum jabbar potter and family right like <laughs> we gotta support everyone <laughs> it's true I love it. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, everyone should check out all the projects that you're working on that I'm privately funding. <laughs> <laughs> the quiet patron of the arts. <laughs> Once you do enough, it's going to be like a whole big, you know, super villain turn. I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Right, my villain years. <laughs> Your max lord villain years. And then my, my wife has Wonder Woman was <laughs> not my deck, and it'll be it'll be all good. Yeah, there yeah. You know. uh, so everyone wild. should check those things out. Uh, J Mike, where can they find you and follow you? Oh man, I have to go behind these guys. Oh god. <laughs> well, you can find me. Sure. I know. Well, I'm still on Twitter for now while it's still alive. While it's certainly on fire right now. I had J Mike 101. I respond to people, post funny gifts, crack a couple jokes here or there, those type of things. Love it. Well, I'm sure when it finally explodes, you will rocket away from the burning Twitter to bring <laughs> truth, justice, and the certain POV way to whatever social media site we decide is the, the new place that we're going to be hanging out. Last uh, son of Twitter, <laughs> hurtling across the blogosphere, where will he land? 
But for now, I am also mostly found on Twitter at Casey Aiken. You can find me on Instagram at Quetzalcoatl5 because I am holding on to that damn AIM screen name for dear <laughs> life. I <laughs> I went through a like a panic attack last night on the Twitch stream. Like, should I change my Twitch handle to Case Aiken so people actually know who I am? And I was like, I would have to change I would have to risk losing the Quetzalcoatl 5 on Twitch also. I was like, can't do it. Can't do it, guys. <laughs> like, <laughs> Some folks go entirely by handles. This is fine. <laughs> but yeah, so Instagram and Twitch, Quetzalcoatl 5. Not that I, I stream myself. So you can find me on Twitch. I, I, that, that, that's all I, I will say. But everywhere else, it's at Case Aiken. The show you can find on Twitter at Men of Steel Pod. And you can find past episodes of this show over at CertainPOV.com, along with Fun and Games, along with, you know, so many other great shows like the four of us here are the people who built this network. Uh, you know, we had Ben and Addy with us and then, but fun and games coming on the, sh- on the network is how it became not just a spin off of certain POV, like how it actually became a collection of people working on stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I'm so glad to do projects with you both because it harkens back to the roots. It harkens back to the community that we've been trying to build. And we have so many great shows on the network now that like we never would have imagined would have been part of it. Like, Absolutely. like United States of women, like it's such a cool project that like, I can't believe we have on here or circling Cersei is another great one. Like so many like incredible works by people who it's amazing that we have them in our, our circle of digital friends out there. And so I, I really encourage everyone to check out all the stuff at certain POV.com to check out more episodes of this show, to check out fun and games, to see the cool, creative things. All that's at certain POV.com or on whatever podcast player you like at certain POV.com. And in all of our show notes, you can find links to our discord server where you can interact with all of us directly. Like, please, it's a lot of fun. We have like really incredible conversations because we've built out such a cool community. Like the music channel has gotten huge and it's wonderful to like, see like these really interesting conversations that like just wouldn't have happened six years ago when we started the show. So it's awesome. I love this community. Please support it. And um, until next time, stay super. Man. Men of Steel is a certain POV production. Our hosts are J. Mike Folson and Case Aiken. The show is scored and edited by Jeff Moonen. And our logo and episode art is by Case Aiken. You can leave that in, Jeff. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> I do what I want. I, I edit yes. now. <laughs> yeah, you are the editor now. The editor. Um, <laughs> Have you ever seen something in a theater that you just couldn't explain? Or have you ever thought about if dying really ain't that bad? And do you spend sleepless nights wondering exactly what happened to Natalie Wood that night on the boat? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then it's time for you to exit stage death. Exit stage death is the chilling true stories behind your favorite Broadway shows. Releasing bi-weekly on Tuesday, starting May 24th. So if you want to find out which Broadway house is the most haunted, talk about what killed our favorite Broadway flops, and learn about the murderous path of Mama Rose that took Gypsy Rose Lee to stardom, it's time for Places, actors. Thank Thank you, you places. Places. It's time to exit stage death. CPOV. CertainPOV.com.